Welcome everybody to um, the international class. We have um, the pleasure of having Boyd Nixon, who is a longtime second generation member of North Avenue, who uh, ministers with Crew, formerly known as Campus Crusade. And um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his ministry. And before we get started, Tom, could I get you to unmute yourself and pray for us? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of your kingdom here amongst us in this crazy and broken world. We give you special thanks for um, campus ministries, for crew in particular, and for uh, the long service of our brother Boyd Nixon. Uh, let us receive the information he brings to us. Uh, let it be inspiring to us and give us uh, courage uh, further and deeper to trust in you in the coming days. We ask this in the name of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Boyd's, um, the four of us have been chatting a little bit beforehand about um, your history with North Avenue, but my guess is um, a lot of people that may be listening in or join in have no recollection of that. I mean, I've never, I never, your father was gone before I joined North Avenue and that was 20 something years ago. So if you give us just a little background about how you got to North Avenue and then how you ended up with crew, that's how we'll start out. Great, great, Renata. Uh, let me start as I'm, as I'm just beginning to share and answer your questions. Let me just start out with uh, one verse that has meant a lot to me, a verse of scripture, which has probably meant a lot to most of us on this call. Um, but that is John 3, 16. And I'm just going to read it. For God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that scripture reflects uh, the heart that God has given me. And that is that all would come to know him. That would entail evangelism as well as discipleship. So my heart has really been uh, evangelism since I've been growing in the Lord. But let me go back uh, just a moment before that. I grew up in three cities. Uh, Philadelphia, here in Atlanta, and Chicago. Was in Philadelphia till age 10, moved down here to Atlanta with my folks to Sandy Springs for two and a half years, then up to Chicago for a year, back to Philadelphia for most of high school years, and then down to, back down here to Atlanta for my last year of high school and stayed in the South, went to the University of Georgia. Um, as I was, as we were in Philadelphia, that's where God began planting spiritual seeds in my heart and life. Um, somehow, some way, we went to a Billy Graham crusade in 1961. My folks came to Christ. My sister mm -hmm. came to Christ. Mm -hmm. I did not. I was there at the crusade, but my decision was four or five years later. Mm -hmm. However, we started attending a large Presbyterian church on the side of town, Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church. And God really planted a lot of spiritual seeds in my heart and life, such that when I moved down here after my freshman or into my freshman year of college, um, was involved with a conference. And that's where I made my decision for Christ um, in, in 1966, freshman year of college, University of Georgia. And while I was at Georgia at school, I was involved in three ministries, Campus Crusade for Christ, Young Life, and InterVarsity. And it was a privilege to be connected with all three. Just to share a moment on how North Avenue uh, has been so influential with me, uh, I can remember many of us probably know the name uh, Leighton Ford. Leighton was uh, Billy Graham's brother-in-law. He went to, had gone to Columbia Seminary, and he would visit North Avenue Presbyterian Church when he was in town. 
we had gotten to know each other just casually. And my senior year, I can remember um, walking down the hall with Leighton. He turned to me and asked, Boyd, what are you going to be doing when you finish school? And I stuttered, meaning I didn't have an answer. I wasn't sure what God was leading next. He said, you ought to go to Urbana. I'd never heard of it, didn't know what he meant. He turned to the right when we got to the sanctuary. I turned to my left. However, I sat down next to a friend who was at Georgia Tech. He was involved with InterVarsity, and he turned to me. He said, boy, guess what? I'm going to Urbana. And I said, Lamar, tell me more. This was a fellow named Lamar Davis. So he told me about Urbana. And then that afternoon, I called a girl back in Athens to go study with me at the library. And we'd usually study for 10 minutes and talk for 20. And uh, she asked me what I was going to be doing when I finished school. I said, I don't know. She said, you ought to go to Urbana. And hmm. she reached down, pulled a brochure out of her pocketbook and handed it to me. And I looked up, I said, God, I'm going to Urbana. I can, I can see what you're saying. So uh, my, my background with Campus Crusade for Christ and with Young Life and with uh, InterVarsity with Urbana was just a wonderful rich time in college wonderful ah. so when you uh you went how did you end up then with crusade as i was finishing school i was a um, i was a business major in college and as i was finishing school um i felt a tug on my heart toward some ministry but did not know what it would be and I really did not want to come back to the college campus. And so I ruled out Campus Crusade for Christ. I did not know there was anything else going on at that time. Um, uh, I had actually been flying, working my way through college, partially paying for college, flying for a company and also teaching, flight instructing. And uh, four of us put a business venture together after school went down into South America looking for old warbirds, old airplanes. When I came back from that trip, one of the first people I met was a fellow named Carl Wilson, who was the founder of the high school ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. I did not know there was such a thing. And that was the first time God said, this is the way, walk in it. So I joined with the high school ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ in 1971. Okay, so you slipped in there that you were a pilot. I didn't know that. Yeah. When when did you become a pilot? When did this happen? Oh, uh, air, I was an airplane nut for forever. And um, at age 14, I took my first three flying lessons. The instructor said, Boyd, you're good, but you can't solo till you're 16. Why don't you save your money? I was living in Philadelphia at the time, so... Uh, cutting grass, raking leaves, shoveling snow. I wouldn't even think dollars and cents. I'd think how much flying time will this buy me? I was totally focused. So at age 16, when I turned 16, I soloed. Then at 17, got my private. 18, got my commercial. And I kept on uh, instructing there at, uh, in Athens at the University of Georgia. Right. And, then I, and then I also flew for a company on a, a small twin engine. Do you still have a license? I do. All right. So you said that you got involved with the high school ministry of Campus Crusade. Um, you know, a lot of us just know the university level ministry, but Crusade or Crew has a very multifaceted uh, ministry. Could you tell us a little bit about that? But you didn't stay with the high school ministry. If you could tell us a little bit about what all Crew does and then what you have done in the last I, at least since I've known you, the last 20 years. Okay. Uh, campus Crusade for Christ was started in 1951 on the UCLA campus by Bill and Bonnet Wright. And um, shortly after it started, over the next several years, people would graduate, college students would finish, and they'd several of them would say, you know, I'd like to do what you're doing, Bill and Bonnet. And so a few people joined and then a few more people joined and a few more people such that uh, there's now 25,000 full-time staff in almost every country around the world. 
Um, shortly after founding Campus Crusade, the first um, international ministry was into Korea. And then it kept expanding as far as uh, both in the States, domestically and internationally. And then other ministries began to, to uh, uh, multiply out of that. We had a uh, high school ministry start. We had a sports ministry start. We had um, international ministry start. Um, each, the, 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 the focus that was the common denominator was evangelism, sharing Christ. Someone has said that um, uh, successful evangelism is simply sharing Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. So that has been something that the ministry of Campus Crusade has focused on, and, uh, and that's what has attracted the people that have joined with our ministry. Was the Jesus film a product of Crusade? Yes, yes. The Jesus film uh, was first the uh, brainchild of Bill Bright in the 70s, seven, 1978 and 79. It was produced and uh, it was really a, uh, uh, a very uh, professionally done, uh, highly involved uh, film that, uh, that was on the life of Christ. And so um, that has been used uh, around the world to see many people presented with the gospel and therefore many people receive Christ. I know in the early years, I was making trips into Russia. And at that time, uh, we were using the Jesus film in Russia. It's been translated into over 1800 languages now. And um, I would, we would use the Jesus film with uh, young people in Russia sometimes showing it in a theater, sometimes showing it on the side of a building, sometimes showing it on a white wall in a classroom. I've used it in the jungles of Africa and we take in a projector and we also take in a generator. And so uh, we would hang a sheet uh, across a line uh, tied to two trees and that sheet would be our, our, um, our screen and then we would uh, plug in the projector into our generator, fire up the generator, and we would just see uh, many, many people come to watch that film in their language. And um, it was a privilege to see God work in hearts and lives using that film. Is there any, has there been any thought about updating the film at all? Have you heard? Uh, great question. And I don't know the answer to that, Renata. Okay. So you talked about um, being in Russia. I know you've taken, you took Nell with you on a lot of trips. So were you with like the church planning arm or what exactly, what group or what facet? Um, you mentioned evangelism. Were you just on evangelism teams? Maybe you've heard the name Josh McDowell. Uh -huh. um, Josh is on the staff with the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I had worked with Josh for three years back in the 70s. Uh, and in fact, my track record was that I first joined with Campus Crusade in 1971, was with Crusade until 79, and then stepped into business for 12 years. So I was in business from 79 to 91, and then joined back again full-time with the ministry of Campus Crusade in 1991, and I've been with Campus Crusade ever since. And like you mentioned, we now have had a name change. We call it CRU, C-R-U. Mm -hmm. um, in 1994, I got a call from the Josh McDowell Ministry asking if I would help to give leadership to one of the projects over in Russia. And uh, Josh was taking a group of people over we would take American adults to go and minister to Russian young people in schools, orphanages, hospitals, and prisons. And, um, and I was asked if I would help to lead one of the teams going over there. And so in 1994, I began a series of trips, usually twice a year, and have made 20 trips into Russia over the years. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful outreach and a wonderful partnership. Early on, we called it Operation Carelift. 
And then we made a name change about halfway through uh, to another name. As my mother was getting older, God put it on my heart to care for her. She had a heart for the Lord, a heart for people, heart for ministry, heart for missions. And so I invited her to come with me. And um, we actually were, we were putting together all of our humanitarian aid up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And um, so I first invited her to come up to Lancaster and, um, and we would have uh, two to 3,000 people join us for two weeks to assemble humanitarian aid that would go over to our projects in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Um, at a point in time, I, I, uh, that, on that first trip, I asked the Lord, if, uh, if you'd like her to go with us to Russia, that'd be great, uh, but you'll need to speak to her, Lord. And, and he did on that time in Lancaster. And she said, you know, I could enjoy a trip to Russia to see where this humanitarian aid is going. And so that was the beginning of eight trips that she made into Western Russia, Siberia, Belarus, and Ukraine, started at age 80 and just kept on going. And, and it was a privilege to care for her that way. Yeah. Boyd, with this uh, ministry, and I've asked this question of everybody um, on the team, what spiritual discipline or disciplines have you seen to be most helpful in maintaining your own relationship with God and just seeing you through, I'm sure, really intense times in ministry? I would say it would be a daily time in the word, a daily time with the Lord. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as, as each of us are trying to maintain our relationship with the Lord, sometimes we fall off the wagon. Sometimes we, uh, we get off the track. And so when I have fallen off the wagon or, or gotten off track, um, I try to jump back on as, as quickly as I can, but it's that time with the Lord and, and the time in the word, the time in scripture. Yes. And then I, I, I let me let me say this, Renata. One other one other thought, and that is, um, I will just like all of us. There are times I will feel closer to the Lord, and there are times I will feel uh, somewhat more distant from the Lord, for whatever reason, whatever what whatever is going on in my own heart and life. Um, I have found that for me, if I will, if I will step out in faith and obedience to share Christ that um, even if I'm not feeling like it, if I'm, if I'm somehow, some way willing to present the gospel or plant a spiritual seed, somehow, some way um, uh, present, uh, present the, uh, the thought of, uh, of someone getting to know the Lord that, many times helps to bring me closer back to God. I've asked all the questions. I have others. Does anybody, Tom, you usually have a question. I can uh, start if you like. You yeah, sure, Sankar. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's in the horizon for your next, uh, uh, Boyd? Uh, what, what's, uh, what's the Lord telling you? Sankar, would you ask that question again? I could not hear you clearly. What's what's in the horizon for you next? You know, what is the where is the God leading you next? You know, want to know. Okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. What's next? Um, yeah. Good, good question. Um, uh, as we're processing through this whole uh, pandemic time period, we have put our um, many of our large events on hold. But uh, we're probably getting close to bringing them back again. So um, let me just share with you uh, a little about what I have been doing in the past. And, um, and it will also pretend to what uh, is going to be in the near future as we, as we go forward. Right now, during this time period, um, what I've been doing um, has been working with men in the marketplace. 
Mm -hmm. uh, working in evangelism with men in the marketplace. And so my ministry over the, over, uh, the weeks and months and the last several years, I met one-on-one -on -one with men here in Atlanta. I'm meeting small group Bible studies with men here in Atlanta. And then I also do event evangelism. And so my year over the last probably five, six, seven years has looked like this. I would start out in late January, early February in Washington, D.C. with the National Prayer Breakfast. And then in late February, uh, I would start focusing on event evangelism. And Sankar, I would look for events that would attract men men and women that, that very likely don't know the Lord, but they were also events that would be of interest to volunteers. So the first event I would do in February would be the, the Miami International Boat Show. Okay. And what I would do would be to go down to that event. I would invite volunteers to join me, whether they were other staff or friends or volunteers that were disciples, but I, I would invite them to join me and we would go down to, to do evangelism in a low key relational and yet intentional way. And so I would focus on a number of events like this over a year. For instance, after uh, February in, um, that would be early, uh, early, uh, well, early February would be the, the prayer breakfast in Washington. Late February would be the Miami Boat Show. Then March would be the Amelia Island Car Show in early March. Late March would be um, the Palm Beach International Boat Show. April would typically be an air show in uh, Lakeland, Florida. So I'd focus on those three types of events, air shows, boat mm. shows, car shows these events attract men men and women both mm -hmm. and so this was a this was a setting to where we could plant spiritual seeds and have conversations that might lead toward sharing christ and uh, and actually seeing some someone pray to receive christ um in uh in june i would go up to lancaster to our lancaster mission project and this would be a packing project where we're assembling the humanitarian aid that I mentioned previously. Mm -hmm. In um, late July, we would always have the, the um, Oshkosh International Air Show, which is the largest air show in the world of all things. It's in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, but uh, there would be 10,000 airplanes and 500,000 people that would come together for that week of uh, uh, air show events. Um, then in September, I would have the Windy Gap Men's Retreat up at Windy Gap, which is just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And Windy Gap is a Young Life ranch and a wonderful, wonderful place and setting for, for various retreats. Mm -hmm. So that would be in September. October, again, would be the Lan second Lancaster Mission Project. And then I would end the year with November being the Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show. So I'm, I'm walking through the, my calendar on a year, which yes. is really a focus with evangelism, discipleship, and ministry skill training mm -hmm. with the men and women who are volunteers and who are there with me at the event. Oh, okay. So your mis mis ministry to Russia is still continuing, is that right? Even though there have been a lot of changes in Soviet Union. The, okay. Yes, there have been a lot of changes. And, and um, I have not been to Russia in some years. As, as many of you know, um, uh, I had been caring for my mother. God put it on my heart to care for my mother in her later years. Yes. And so um, uh, I was really staying back stateside in the later years rather than traveling back into Russia. So once this pandemic is over, uh, it's my intent to regroup and refocus and we'll see what God does.
Okay. We'll see what he puts on the, the calendar and what um, what geographic locations he puts in place. It's right. wonderful. Boyd, I will say publicly that I have shared your testimony of you caring for your mother with many people. Um, I, it would have been very easy for you to say to your sister to take care of mom. Mm -hmm. And I have said that um, I know a man, a single man that has uh, said to the Lord that he was going to take care of his mother and he did. And I've said that to many people, boy, that I think that's a wonderful testimony that that's something that you did for now. Mm -hmm. It did not go unnoticed. Well, thank you, Renata, for saying that. It, uh, it was a privilege to care mm -hmm. for her and God had put it on my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I will also tell you that it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Oh, at sure. Conference. Um, there were, there would be times where I would be, uh, maybe meeting with somebody across the city, across town. And although she was at the house and I was meeting with that person across the table from me, I'd have one eye on him, but I'd have the other eye on her mentally and emotionally. So, um, uh, challenging at times, but you know, it was wonderful. We all have our challenges and, um, and, and that was simply my challenge and my privilege. But thank you for saying that, Renata. Amen. 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 Renata, I have a question of Boyd. This is Frank Demick. Um, hey, first Frank. Let, first, let me say, Boyd, I really appreciate hearing your story. Um, I hadn't heard it before, and it's truly amazing and obviously spirit-led. Um, thinking about your last 30 years, since 91, when you reconnected and, and got deeply involved with crusade and crew what is the most important lesson that you've learned in that 30 years what uh maybe what would you do differently if you were back or if you were advising a young person just starting out what would be the message that you would tell them great question i'd say one or two things that come to the come to the top of my mind frank um one is to try to pay attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Try to pay attention to that still, small voice that, um, that uh, I hear in my heart and mind. And, and then, therefore, to try to step out in faith and obedience and to, um, to do just exactly um, what he was saying. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of that, and um, and uh, I wasn't sure whether I was going to share this or not. But since you asked that question that way, I'll I'll uh, put it together. And that's this: um, I came in, I came in um, on a Saturday evening uh, uh, some years ago to the house. Was not ready to go to bed. I picked up the newspaper. And, um, and, um, uh, and I saw, as I was reading, I saw that, uh, Jimmy Carter was hosting a gathering Sunday evening, a reception for Mikhail Gorbachev, Gorbachev, um, who was going to be speaking the following day at commencement at Emory university. But there were also a list of, um, a list of people that were invited and, um, and one of those was Tom and Ann Cousins from our church, from North Avenue. And mm -hmm. I sensed that the Holy Spirit was prompting me that evening to pull out two envelopes and write two names on the front of the envelope. One was Mikhail and Raisa Gorbachev. And the other envelope, I wrote Tom and Ann Cousins. And I had some gospel tracts that were bilingual. They were in both Russian and English. And so I put two bilingual tracks in the envelope to Mikhail Gorbachev. I jotted a note to him, put my card in there and sealed it up. Jotted, uh, I put two, uh, two of the uh, gospel tracks in the envelope for Tom and Ann Cousins and sealed them up, put them in my sport coat uh, pocket and went to bed. Next morning I got up and came down to North Avenue 
And the first person I saw as I was walking down the hall was Tom Cousins coming out of a classroom that he was in for Sunday morning class. And uh, I said, Tom, I've got something for you. I said, uh, I told him what I just told you. And I said, I've jotted this envelope. I see that you're going to be at the reception with uh, President Carter and the Gorbachevs. And he said, well, how do you see that? I said, it was in the newspaper. He said, oh, I didn't know that. So, um, so I gave him the, uh, the envelope and I said, if, if you feel it's appropriate, you might pass on this gospel track to, uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev. And he looked at me, Tom, Tom Cousins looked at me and said, Boyd, I have been praying for Mikhail and Raisa Gorbachev for a year. Mm. And he took, that, he took that envelope. Well, the story continues. Later that morning after church, back in those years, you may remember, we would have a coffee hour uh, after the church service. And so I walked, I walked into the coffee hour and asked, um, um, uh, asked somebody um, if they knew how to get into the commencement exercise the next day at Emory. And that person said, well, you'll never, you'll never get in. There's usually 10,000 people there. Tomorrow there'll be 20,000. Um, and, but the next person that came up to me was, was Dot Matty. You remember Dot, Jim and Dot Matty from the international class. Dot Matty had a fellow from Africa that she was uh, leading up and wanted to introduce me to him. And that was Francis Githier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Francis and I began talking and halfway into our conversation, I asked him, I said, Francis, by the way, do you happen to know anybody that has a ticket for tomorrow at Emory, the commencement exercise? And he looked at me and he said, um, he said, uh, I want, he opened his coat, had a ticket in his uh, coat pocket. And he said, I wondered who this ticket was for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so he gave it to me so, and he said, but you got to get there early tomorrow morning. So I got there very, very early. And, um, President Carter came in, President Gorbachev came in, we stood up, we sat down, stood up, sat down, stood up, sat down. We did that for probably six, eight, ten times. And as President Gorbachev was continuing to speak, I finally realized I've got to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's getting bad. So the next time we stand up, I'm going to plan to exit left, which I did. So I got, I went through the, uh, through the exit, asked security guard where the closest bathroom was. He pointed to the basement of the building we were in front of. After I came out, I thought I'll never be able to get back in again. But I went up to that same security guard. He looked at me, said, you want to go in? I said, yes. I was surprised. So rather than going to my seat, I just stood at the corner of the building. And as I heard President Gorbachev finish his speech, then I heard a lot of clapping. And all of a sudden I heard footsteps and I was on one corner of the building and President Gorbachev was coming around the other corner. He looked at me. I looked at him. He stuck his hand out. We shook hands, had a big handshake. And then President Carter followed President Gorbachev. And I was so excited having shaken Gorbachev's hand that I missed Carter's hand and got his elbow. We, we both shook each other's elbow and I've, I've laughed about that. But immediately I realized the people I really want to be with are have just walked past me. So I did a 180, turned around and walked out together with President Carter, about a half a step behind him, and President Gorbachev. They were heading to the limousines that would take the Gorbachevs away. And the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and reminded me, said, Boyd, you've got an envelope in your sport coat pocket for President Gorbachev. So I pulled it out and I gave it to President Carter and he looked at it. He did something of a sniff test, handed it over to a gal that was walking with them. And she was either President Gorbachev's secretary or their daughter. I don't know which, but we got to the limo and um, they got in the back seat. The driver got in the front seat, but the girl, the secretary or the daughter, she got in the jump seat in the middle and on her lap was a pile of envelopes and, and paperwork. But on the top piece was the envelope I had 
for President Gorbachev, which had the gospel in it. And I've often thought, isn't that interesting that God used the former president of the United States to pass the gospel on to the former president of the Soviet Union? Wow, great story. That was my little story, which turned out to be a big story, I know. Yeah. A big story. Amazing. Renata, go ahead. You're no, no, no. I was just going to say that's a that's a big. I have I have known you ever since I've been at North Avenue, and you've said things today that I've never heard before. You mean why we have to do these things? Exactly. I've got a few more that I'd love to share with you. You, you just you just keep me in the time frame. Go go right ahead. We got plenty of time. Okay. Like I mentioned, I'm not really doing any projects right now. It's more one on one evangelism. And, um, and God has given some opportunities uh, lately. Um, living in Stone Mountain, uh, it's like Clarkston. It's one of the most international communities in the country. And um, two houses down, a dear family from Nepal has moved in. And I would many times go up to um, a farm market up above Gainesville, Georgia, stop in there and I'd buy, I'd buy uh, some fruit or vegetables in large quantities in boxes and I'd bring them back to the house and, and pass them out to neighbors in the, vill in the community. And so this was a, 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 a certainly a neighborhood goodwill uh, effort on my part, but I enjoyed being with them. It was not an effort, it was just, uh, it was a joy. Um, one of the families I would meet with was this family from Nepal. And so I would bring them tomatoes, I'd bring them um, peaches, I'd bring them whatever was available on that season. And, um, but I was cleaning outside, cleaning the car one day, uh, doing a little bit of washing. And I looked up and there was my Nepal neighbor. His first name is Amber. He was down at the, at the end of the driveway at the street and he was also watching his, his son and his brother-in-law on a little motor, motor scooter. But I walked down to be with him, and we started talking for just a short little bit. And at a point in time, I felt led to say, I said, Amber, may I pray for you? He said, yes. So what I did, I opened up one of my gospel tracts didn't go all through the, the plan of salvation. I just went to the prayer and I said, I'm going to pray this prayer for you that I have prayed for me and for others. So you follow along. If you'd like, you can pray out loud. If you want to pray silently in your own heart, your choice. So I went ahead and read through the prayer slowly, line by line, gave him a chance to make it his own. At the end, I said, amen. He said, amen. And I asked him, I said, did you pray that prayer? He said, yes, I did. Then I turned over to three verses on the next page that give assurance of salvation. First John five verses 11, 12, and 13. And um, so went through that with him. We had a few more words of conversation and I said, goodbye. He said, goodbye. He walked back to his house and I thought that was it. Well, three weeks later, I was in my carport writing some, uh, doing some paperwork, and Amber walks up to the carport. And I thought he wanted to probably talk, but he looked at me and said, Boy, can you walk down to my house with me and lead my family to Christ? Renata, I was blown away. I bet. I said, I said yes. Uh, when do you want to go? Later today or tomorrow or next week? And he said, right now. And I said, I'm with you. So we walked down to the house. He brought his family into the living room. This time I went through the entire plan of salvation. Uh, Amber, the father, had to interpret together with his son. So it was Amber and his wife, his son and his daughter and his mother. And so both Amber and the son uh, had to interpret. And um, um, we went through the entire plan of salvation. At the end, I, I prayed and everybody prayed with me. And I thought, that's just amazing. Well, Aunt, everybody else goes out of the, the room. Amber and I walk over to the dining room table. We sit down. And about that time, a sixth family member comes in the door 
It's Amber's sister who's married and lives behind them. And Amber looks at me and said, Boyd, my sister wants to pray to receive Christ. So on that one day, uh, I, I had, I, I was blown away and had a privilege of seeing God bring six people uh, to faith. It, it was just Boyd, amazing. Are they plugged into a, I'm sure there's a Nepalese congregation of some kind here. Bible yes, they, they've gotten plugged in with a, a Nepali pastor. They've wow. all been they've all been baptized and i mean i am just blown away how god works i just i was just standing there or sitting there on the sidelines minding my own business and god did god did all this work and it's it's really been neat to see amazing yeah yeah um um let me uh try to put another couple opportunities together i um uh, i'm gonna m most you know most opportunities are um sharing christ with people that you and i will never see again or you and i will never know unless they're neighbors uh down the road but mm -hmm. i'm going to share this one other opportunity um after my mother passed away um six months later i was realizing that you know i could enjoy some different scenery i could enjoy uh uh to see some see and meet some different people and so um there uh, actually at north avenue there was somebody that was speaking on a trip to italy and when i went to hear her uh i thought this was this was interesting but it's not quite what i'm looking for i'm not sure what it is that i'm looking for so i, I heard her and then I talked with a, a friend of mine, a mutual friend of ours, um, um, Renata, and um, and then uh, and then I got a brochure that was on a cruise on the Mediterranean, and I thought, you know, this may be the the trip that I'm looking for. And um, as I as I went on that trip, we flew into um, we flew into Athens, Greece, uh, made about a two week trip and then came back out of Rome, Italy. And while I was at the airport in Rome, um, I was waiting to queue up in line to get on the airplane and the, the flight attendant or the, the, uh, the gal at the desk said, okay, it's your turn to come on. And she looked at another fellow. We both gave her our boarding passes and we both started walking down the, the, um, the gangplank to the airplane and started talking about the Lord started talking about spiritual things and we got into the airplane and he turned into the first class seating. Um, I hadn't quite finished my story. And so I, I slipped in with him to first class and we finished talking and, um, and I looked at him and I said, may I pray for you? I put my, I put my hand on his shoulder. He said, yes. So I went through that same prayer that I just mentioned to you about the neighbors from Nepal. And uh, at the end, we both got up, introduced ourselves, and he said, I'm King David. And I looked at him and I thought, how do I respond to this? He said, he's King David. I said, I'm Boyd Nixon. Then he went on to explain that he is a king from Africa, probably a tribal king, but he had been flown to a Greek Orthodox monastery in greece and when he was baptized there he was given the name king david so nonetheless he prayed there at the uh, uh, as we were sitting in first class it was my time to go back and sit down on the airplane which my seat was in economy it was in the tail end of economy so i walked to the very back of the airplane sat down between two people and five minutes later, I looked up and here this this king is walking down the aisle and he comes over to my seat and grabs me by the arm and pulls me up. He says, boy, you are going to sit in my first class seat and I am going to sit in your economy seat. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, yes, yes, yes. He walks me down the aisle, sits me in his first class seat, gives me his boarding pass. And he says, now you're legit. And he comes back, turns around, and um, and takes my seat in um, in economy, 
And as we were taking off, uh, I got to thinking only God could have orchestrated something like that. So I've, I've had to laugh. And I said, that's my story of the king and I. Oh. And um, you never know who God's going to put in front of you. Mm-mm. Well, when I travel next, I'll look for King David. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, he was, he was from the Ivory Coast. Okay. <laughs> I'll look him up. You know, it's always I, the other way with me. You know, somebody will say, sorry, sir, you're sitting in my seat. Could you go back to the coach? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was, I, was, um, I was up last weekend. I was up last weekend at that same farm market up above Gainesville, Georgia. It's called Jaymore Farms. And while I was there, I, um, I had a gospel tract and began talking with a fella. Uh, we started talking about his motorcycle. He had come up on his motorcycle, and I parked right next to him. And uh, as we talked, he said, um, "He said um, I asked him where he was from. He said, well, I was, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. Well, I pulled, I said, by any chance, um, did you happen to worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Montgomery? He said, that was my home church. Wow. And I said, by any chance, did you happen to know a former pastor that I had when I lived in Nashville, Tennessee, his name was Cortez Cooper. We called him Cordy. He said, I knew him very well. He was there when I was there years ago. So rather than, rather than seeing this person as somebody who is possibly uh, desires to pray to receive Christ, he, uh, I gave him a little gospel track and I said, um, I said, see who the Lord uh, puts on your heart to, uh, to pass this on to. But it was, it was a privilege. And then a second fellow, a second fellow had a, another motorcycle. I said almost the same things to him. And he also seemed to know the Lord. So it was a, it was a time, hopefully, of encouragement and planting spiritual seeds, but not evangelism. Mm, but so I, I guess right now the Lord has me sharing Christ and presenting the gospel when there seemed to be opportunities um, as a way of life. Uh, as, as I walk along, I, I try to be faithful and diligent and yet at the same time filled with the spirit and, and, um, and, and share the Lord, plant spiritual seeds as able. Now, this is what happened to Paul when he was walking around the street in Athens. You know, people said, you are saying some strange things. Can we hear more about it? And uh, that opened up a lot of doors for him. So amazing how the Lord works. Great. You are right, Sankar. You yeah. are right. Mm-hmm. Christ Boy, called. How can we... Go ahead, Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead, Frank. Christ called and spirit led. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Boyd, how can we pray for you? What can we pray for specifically? Oh, my goodness. Thank you for asking. Well, I have the privilege um, of rebuilding my house right now. And I've also had the privilege of having a surgery in front of me um, when the house is finished. And that's my hip surgery. Uh, It looks like I'm going to need a hip replacement. Um, On the end of October, October 29th, I was laying in bed. We had the remnants of a hurricane blowing through Atlanta. I think it was Hurricane Zeta. And um, at 5.30 in the morning, uh, I saw, I was looking out the window. The trees were almost horizontal. The rain was pounding down. And about that time, as I was praying and asking the Lord for protection, uh, a massive tree came down on top of the house, destroyed the roof, destroyed two bathrooms, destroyed the plumbing. Um, water on ceilings and walls. So I, uh, I got up, I called the insurance company, filed a claim. It was still dark out. I looked around a little bit, couldn't see much, went back to bed, got under the covers and waited for daylight and um, could, could then see uh, the damage. So insurance has placed me in a hotel since mid-December Looks like the house will be completed end of March. So I've been looking at uh, some wonderful people, wonderful workmen, uh, putting this house back together, both the roof and bathrooms, et cetera. So 
the house that I be them wise to know what to do with the house, and then also wisdom to know when to go forward um, with hip surgery and hip replacement. So those are our two prayer requests that are right in front of me. Thank you, Renata. Okay. We will definitely pray for that. Yeah. Um, now I wanted to share something. Uh, do you all know Leslie Holmes by any chance? I know Boyd knows him and uh, Renata, was he a minister? No, I know who he is. Isn't he British yeah. or Scottish or? Yeah. I, Irish, uh, yeah. Irish, okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted and, to share and, a prayer request. And I knew, I knew Leslie Sankar. Yeah, great. Yeah, and uh, I think Tom McLeod would know him also. Anyways, uh, he is in Augusta, Georgia. You know, he was, uh, after he left our church, he, he went different places. He ended up in Augusta, and he was the provost for the Erskine Theological Seminary. Anyway, he has retired. His wife, Barbara, you know, just had an open heart surgery, very similar to what uh, Dr. McDonald had mm -hmm. to replace the valves. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I felt uh, led to just tell our group uh, to pray for Barbara and his family. And, right. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, will sh I will share his uh, email, you know, message I got from him with you, Boyd, and also with uh, Renata and Tom. And uh, uh, also with Frank. Uh, yeah. Please. Yes. I'd like to see that. Sure. Yeah. Sankar, do either you or Frank have any update on Steve Rimbert? How are his issues? I don't have anything on Steve at all. Um, I think Steve is uh, waiting some further results of tests, but seems to be the pain seems to be relieved. Um, I know Nancy was with um, Betsy a few days ago out here in the yard with Glennis, but I wasn't privy to their conversation. I um, but the fact that she feels free to move around and be away from home is is probably a sign that he's at least stable and maybe uh, doing much better but i don't have anything further than that uh, i wanted to ask um uh sankar or or renata do you have a could you give a quick word of uh with alan mcdonald was that a sudden onset or was that something that was uh planned for some time to have the uh the um the little i the know order. is that it wasn't sudden i think that there was a decision that that was the way to go yeah. um okay. I, I know a lot of people have stints but he chose to have um the email i got from ann carter was just brief and said that he had five bypasses okay and uh i talked to glennis friday um, and, you know, people don't have that surgery very often anymore. And I sat back and I think they crack open your chest and, and do that. And so he was in the ICU and I know that he's been extubated. And that was uh, the latest I heard from Glennis. What does extubated mean? In other words, he was in the ICU, not breathing on his own. He had an intubation tube. Okay. Uh, that's to keep you stable after the surgery. Um, and that it had been taken out. So he's breathing on his own. That's, that's okay. Great. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Sankar, could you close us? This has been wonderful, Perfect. Boyd. Like I said, a lot of us thought we knew you, but we realized, at least I did, <laughs> uh, realized that I didn't know half of your history. And okay. so I appreciate you sharing so much with us. Um, yeah. You know, the I, folks on the GO team um, also review these. And so it helps us as a, a ministry team to know what our, our ministry partners are doing. And we really, really appreciate um, you taking the time today. That's We're not, it's great to be with you and, and Sankar and others. And it's been a privilege to, to visit and share a little bit what God's been doing. Thank you.